Bible or your Bible app and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 is our text. Uh, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device and you're in the room, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 1167, and you'll find Philippians chapter 4. You'll be able to follow along. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. We really do want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. And if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, well, you can't take one home with you because you already are home. So just let us know. Either let the service host know, uh, email us, and we will get a Bible to you. Or the next time you're in the room, you can take one with you as well. Because we want people to read the Word of God. Because if you read God's Word and apply God's Word, God will change your life. And we know that. So have you ever read a personal letter or email that was intended for someone else. Maybe you're going through, you know, your parents' stuff and they're, they're deceased and you're looking through and you find old letters and you read it and you're kind of surprised by some of the things they said. Or maybe you stumble across an email and you read it and you're like, oh, that's not for me. And you're surprised by what it contains, some of those awkward moments. Anybody ever had one of those uh, situations? Okay, some hands go up. The rest of you are like, no, that's invasion of privacy. You guys are wrong. <laughs> well, anyway. Hey, we are coming to the end of our Philippians study, and this is a deeply personal letter from the Apostle Paul to a church that he started and that he loved. In fact, you could argue that the Philippian church was his favorite church. And, and, and I say that because if you read all the letters of Paul, this one's very personal. He names people in it, he talks about them, and he's not really angry at them like he, he kind of is in 1 Corinthians and stuff when he does the same, but, but that one's a, a strong rebuke letter. So this may be his favorite, you know, church that he started. And, and throughout this letter, he's been uh, just sharing his heart. He talked about assurance of salvation. He talked about the mission that to live is Christ and to die is gain. He, he painted this beautiful picture of Jesus' selfless sacrifice and challenged all of us to have the same attitude as Jesus. He pointed out the dangers of legalism, the absolute unequivocal value of our salvation above everything else, and reminded us that we are citizens of heaven. He inspired us to press on, to rejoice always, and that we really can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And then he comes to that kind of that final paragraph of his letter, this deeply personal, incredibly inspiring letter, and Paul concludes with a conversation about money. Money. Not what you'd expect. I don't think it'd be what you'd expect. I mean, you know, think about this. What do you say to your loved ones when, when they're packing up and they're leaving? Your kids come home to visit and they're leaving, or your kids are going off to college. What do you say when they're getting in the car and going away, right? Right? Everybody has the same conversation, right? Love you, drive safe, call me when you get there. Am I the only one who says that? Okay, right? Isn't that the kind of like the, they, they teach that to you in parenting school or something? So, love you, drive safe, call me when you get there. Paul doesn't do that. You know what Paul's closing is like? He's like, hey, love you, drive safe, and don't rack up any credit card debt. <laughs> I mean, it's just like unexpected. It's like, why did you close the letter this way? Why did you end it this way? Well, I, I think there's two, you know, kind of obvious reasons that Paul just ends his deeply personal letter talking about money. First one is because God knows that all of us struggle with money. Not just us, but like all people in the world struggle with this universal challenge to overcome selfishness and greed and surrender control of our resources to God. I mean, that's why the Old Testament talks about money a lot. That's why Jesus extensively taught about money and possessions and, and what we value. And the Apostle Paul never, ever shies away from discussing money. So God knows we struggle. And then the second reason is Paul talks about money in his letter to the Philippians in his closing is because they were excellent in how they invested their money. He's commending them because they're partnering with him in ministry. So let's listen in. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Paul says, It was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians know yourselves that in the beginning of the gospel, 
When I left Macedonia, that's where Philippi is, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So when I read this, there's, there's three things that pop out, three truths that pop out that I hope you can see in this passage that will help you in your universal battle with uh, that struggle with money and, and its place in our life. So just three things that I, I think jump out at us. First one is God commends generosity. God commends generosity. Uh, Look again at verses 14 through 16. It was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no other church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Just you. Even when I was in Thessalonica, which was not far from Philippi, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Once and again. No, uh, look, God commends generosity, and Paul is commending the church in Philippi for their generosity. So, as a parent, it makes us proud when we see our kids living out in a way that reflects our values, doesn't it? Those moments, whether they're minors or whether they're adults, and, and you see them and they're expressing that, that uh, value that is important to you, that, that you hold on to, that you think is near and dear, and you see them living that out without you having to remind them, right? You know, like without you having to, like, like when your kids are little and they say thank you without you prompting them. And you're just like, yes. You're so proud in that moment. Same is true in an adult. When you see them acting out of your values, the things that you taught them, you rejoice. So guess what? Our Heavenly Father is delighted when His children are generous. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then understand this truth. Your heavenly Father, your, your Lord and Savior if you want to hear him commend you, if you want to receive praise from Jesus, be generous. Be generous. I got to look up there. Okay, God commends. They got different notes in the back. That's all good. So uh, I just want to see if they had it up there. So be generous. I just read Philippians chapter 4. You, you heard Paul commend the Philippian church for their generosity towards him over and over and over again. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus commends the widow who, who gives everything she has in the offering. I don't know if you know the story or not, but Jesus is sitting there with his disciples, and they're watching people give offerings at the temple. And by the way, when you gave offerings at the temple, it was a very public thing. People would come, and they would pour their money in, and they would make all this noise about it because they were trying to you know, receive the applause of men. And this widow sneaks in, and she drops two two cents, the two smallest coins they had into the offering plate and then sneaks away. And Jesus said, hey, see her? She gave more than all the rest of them because she gave out of her need. She sacrificed in order to give to God. So Jesus commended generosity. And then in Matthew 26 is the story of, again, of Jesus when, when this, uh, he's gathered with his friends shortly before his betrayal, shortly before his arrest and crucifixion. And uh, and a woman comes with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, we don't think much about perfume. I mean, you know, it's expensive, but it's not crazy expensive. Well, to them, it was crazy expensive. That perfume was worth about uh, twenty to $40,000 in today's money. And she broke it open and she poured it out on Jesus. And all of the people who are part of the finance committee of the disciples <laughs> started complaining can you believe the waste? This money, this, this could have been sold and we could have taken the money and we could have given it to the poor people. 
I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do? And Jesus rebuked them and said, she did a beautiful thing to me. In her generosity, she gave an extravagant gift, recognizing my sacrifice is coming up. You see, God commends generosity over and over and over again in Scripture. By the way, this is one reason that Calvary practices generosity as a church. I don't know if you're really aware of how much generosity we practice, but whenever you drop a dollar in the offering box that are located by the doors, uh, 20 cents of that we give away to mission causes around the world. Okay? I mean, we just, we give away 20%. So 20 cents out of every dollar just automatically goes out rather than helping to do the ministry right here in Havasu and Parker. And, and then we take up a benevolence offering. You guys give to that on a monthly basis. Whenever we celebrate uh, communion, you guys have a chance to give. And, and that money goes to, to help people in Havasu and Parker that have extra needs. In other words, you give us money so we can give it away. And we give it away. And, and then as a, as a church and as individuals in the church, we you know, develop wells in Mozambique so people can have fresh water to drink. We sponsor compassion centers in Honduras so kids can be fed. We, we help to uh, you know, sponsor refugee ministries in Greece so that people can be fed and clothed and hear the gospel. You see, God commends generosity. And I want God to commend Calvary for generosity. I, I want God to commend my life for generosity. So let me ask you a question. Would God commend you for being generous? Now, if you don't like the answer, then can I encourage you to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit this week about what generous looks like in your life? Because God commends generosity. And then Paul tells us not only does God commend generosity, but generosity benefits the giver. Generosity benefits the giver. Look at verse 17 again. He says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now, now, Paul says, look, he just got done telling us, I've learned to be content whatever circumstances I'm in. That's, you know, right before verse 13, about the, I can do all things through Christ. If you missed that sermon last week from Joe, you need to listen to it. So he says, look, I've learned to be content, so I don't need the gift. I appreciate the gift. I commend you for the gift, but I don't need the gift. But I'm excited about how God has blessed you through the gift. Because generosity benefits the giver. Now, one of the crazy biblical principles uh, that we talk about a lot here at Calvary is reciprocity. Reciprocity. It, it means you reap what you sow. Now, again, I like, I like to educate us so that we, we speak differently than the world. The world uh, erringly refers to this as karma. Okay, when people talk about karma, they are not talking about karma as the, the word actually exists. Okay, karma describes a Hindu philosophy about your next life being impacted by this life. It has nothing to do with this life. People talk about, well, karma, what they're talking about is what goes around comes around. What they're talking about is you reap what you sow. So let's just all agree that karma is crap. With a K, you can quote me on that, all right? Look, it is. What we believe is reciprocity, biblical reciprocity. God built this into the world that we live in. You are always going to reap what you sow, which is why God always keeps telling you to sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. But this is a crazy principle for a lot of people in the world, but especially when it comes to money. Especially when it comes to money. But God teaches that. I mean, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, right here, this is for your benefit more than it's for my benefit. And, and there's a battle going on in our minds. A lot of times we convince ourselves that we cannot afford to be generous. I, I've had people tell me, wow, I just can't afford to be generous, but when we make more money, then we'll, we'll be generous. You're deceiving yourselves. Truth is, if you don't have any money, you can't afford not to be generous. You go, uh, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't, but it's true. You see, if you think, oh, I don't have much, so I can't afford to give, then you are giving in to the common sense lie from Satan. 
Okay? By the way, Satan's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to rob you of blessings, and he wants to convince you that, that you should ignore the Word of God and live life your way, and that you'll be better off if you do that. But the truth is, it leads to destruction. And God wants to bless you, and one of the ways he blesses you is through generosity, when you are being generous. So when we are generous, we benefit from it. I mean, look, if you've helped somebody, if you've been generous, it feels good to be generous, uh, to bless other people. Uh, and, and as the, the, the giver, we receive more blessing than the people who receive. If you've be ever been in that place, look, in somebody's desperate, they are so thankful to receive your generosity, but you're more blessed than they are. And in that moment, you know it. You know it. And see, Paul is talking about the fruit that increases to your credit. Now, I like how he puts it in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, because it's a little blunter, and I kind of like, you know, direct speech. Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. See, you reap what you sow. Did you catch that? If you sow and you're cheap and you don't sow much, you're not going to reap much. But if you are generous when you sow, you're going to reap generously. That's the principle. That's black and white. That's how God's economy works. That's how this world is set up to function by our King, by our Savior, by our Lord. Now, I love how Proverbs puts it in chapter 11, verse 25. Okay, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Now, is, is that clear enough for you? Proverbs is a book of wisdom, and it's, and it's written by the wisest guy in the world who's ever lived, and he says, like, a generous person will prosper. And whoever refreshes others, gives to others, blesses others, will himself be refreshed. Now, what an amazing statement. But it's... it's agreeing with all that Scripture teaches about you're going to reap what you sow. So you might honestly believe that you cannot afford to be generous at this point in your life. But the truth is the opposite. You can't afford not to be generous. Practice generosity. If you desire blessings, if you desire the best that God has, practice that generosity. Now, some of you are going, no, but if I get more, I'll, I'll, then, I'll, then I'll give. No, no. Whoever's faithful with little will be faithful with much. And if you're faithful with little, you'll be given much. So, look, generosity benefits the giver. Now, here's the other side. God blesses the generous. Sometimes, he'll bless the generous with more money. Okay? Because you reap what you sow. Sometimes. But God's not an investment bank. He doesn't guarantee returns uh, or anything like that, dollar for dollar. So if you, I mean, if you handle your money his way, you're going to be blessed, all right? But, but here's the thing. The best blessings are far beyond the material. See, in our fallen, sinful state, we think about money. We, oh, I need more money. And, and the truth is, the blessings of God go way beyond the dollar, right? For the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. Now, if you just pause right there, I don't know anybody that, that doesn't want more love, joy, and peace in their life. Those are the blessings that God gives. It goes on, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, this is what God wants to fill our lives with. What Pastor Joe talked about last week, contentment. You know, the, the, that's what the blessings of God look like that go way beyond the dollar. So trust God with how he's gonna bless you. And, and by the way, the additional benefit of practicing generosity, one of the ways that God benefits the giver is, is that it sets us free from the idolatries of selfishness and greed. Let me say that again. When you practice generosity, it sets you free from the idolatries of selfishness and greed. All of us suffer from this battle with selfishness and this battle with greed. When I say all of us, I kind of mean all of us. All right, I haven't met anybody yet who, who can't be greedy at some point or selfish at some point. And we all know the world is driven by money and greed. 
I mean, it's a universal temptation that is out there. And, and you might think, well, that's only because we're a rich society. No, I've been in Mozambique, the, one of the poorest nations in the world, and, and greed is just as prevalent among the extreme poor as it is among the extreme rich. It's a common temptation for all of us. And, and understand, the, the world is going to tell you, you've got to get more, you've got to acquire more, you've got to hold on to more, you've got to have all this stuff. But, but here's the reality. While money can provide temporary affection, money can't buy you love. There's been some songs about that too. Money can support a posse, but it can't really purchase friendship. Money can provide you with a lot of comfort, but it'll never give you satisfaction. Money can even help you control other people, but it will never inspire devotion. See, money is a vain pursuit. It's an empty pursuit. And God doesn't want to see us waste our lives pursuing the gain of money at the cost of our souls. And so he encourages us, hey, if you want to defeat these idols in your life, if you want to, you know, defeat greed and selfishness, then practice generosity. You just keep practicing generosity. It's part of the plan for you spiritually to develop and to grow. Because God's solution to the temptation for greed is for us to give it away. Not all of it. You obviously need some to live on, but on a regular basis to practice generosity and to give. First of all, give to God. There's this thing called a tithe. It means 10% of your income. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, that, that's kind of what God expects you to give to him to be faithful. If you're not a follower of Jesus, keep your money because it's, it's not going to do you any good to give it anyway. But, but here's the thing. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you've said, I'm a follower, then, then here's the expectation. It's blatantly clear in the Old Testament and it's affirmed in the New Testament. But that's just the beginning point because it doesn't stop there. You know, give to help the poor. Give to bless those who are working hard to build a life need a hand up, give to bless those who cannot bless you because when you do that, it protects you from selfishness and greed. It's kind of the antidote, if you will, to free your soul. So God commends gen generosity and generosity will benefit the giver. Third thing that jumps out is that God will supply your needs. God will supply your needs. Uh, verse 19, a lot of people, uh, I look, I grew up in church, I heard this verse quoted a lot. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Great promise. And, and, and basically what Paul is saying is when we are living a generous, obedient life, God promises to supply our needs. Now, did you catch the conditions attached to this? If you've been reading this whole passage, it's about people who are being generous and who are giving to support ministry, uh, ministry of life change, ministry of starting churches. And he says, hey, you're being generous, so because you're being generous, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. It is not a standalone verse. Now, I heard it all my life growing up as a standalone verse. People would say, well, I need this. Well, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You don't have to be afraid. Yeah, God's going to supply yeah, but there's some conditions attached to it. The conditions are obedience and generosity. So it does not apply if you are being a cheap church or a stingy follower of Jesus. It does apply if you're being a generous church and a generous follower of Jesus. So if you're being a generous, obedient follower of Christ, then God's going to supply your needs. But notice he's going to supply your needs, not your wants. This is where it gets kind of, I don't know, maybe a little bit tough for us because we're so blessed that we confuse wants and needs all the time. It's really easy to do. Um, and, and by the way, since we're sinners, we've already established that we all have selfish desires, all of us. And, and it's a whole lot easier to defeat them when you acknowledge them and you point them out and you shine the light on them. So uh, I'm guilty occasionally. You're driving by and you see one of those billboards, you know, about the lottery and $200 million or $500 million, and you're going, God, that'd be really nice if you sent me the winning ticket. 
This is how I pray. Look, I, I'm, I'm praying and sinning at the same time. And, uh, and I'm like, God, really, you know, because if you sent that ticket to me, oh, I would do so much good with it. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd pay back Calvary, all the salary they've paid me for the almost 30 years. And I'd build all the new buildings that we need to build and, and do all that kind of stuff. We'd be debt-free. And, and, I'd, and we'd bless ministries all over the world. And yeah, I'd have a nice new house and some newer cars and do all this kind of stuff. Look, and, and, I, and, and I acknowledge that. And I go, okay, God. And it, you know what? And my character is, is solid enough. It really wouldn't be a threat to my soul. And my kids are pretty, they're pretty solid. It really wouldn't be a threat to their souls. It'd probably ruin my grandkids' lives. So thank you for not indulging that fantasy. Uh, you see, God promises to provide for our needs and most of us are abundantly provided for. Most of us are living in our wants, not our needs. And we need to remember that. Because God promised us to, to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. But that's needs, not wants. And then, when we trust God, he blesses us. When we trust God financially... He blesses us. God's going to provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Uh, but we've got to trust God. And that means that's, that's got to include financials. Because it's easy to say that we trust God and still worry. It's easy to say that we trust God and not put our money where our faith is. Now, I'm, I'm just going to say this because, you know, Calvary is an incredibly generous church, and you guys are, are being obedient to Jesus, and we're doing ministry like crazy. But um, it's easy to not put our money where our faith is. And uh, I was thinking about this, and I think the tithe is a financial declaration of faith. Now, we like to celebrate baptisms here. You heard about the lake baptism? Hey, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, can I encourage you to, to sign up for the lake baptism? Or if you don't want to get baptized in the lake, just fill out the connect card and say, I want to get baptized and tell us when, because we'll do it at any service right here in this baptistry right over here. If you can't do it on the weekend, we'll do it during the week at your house, at a house, at a pool. We don't care. We'll baptize you anywhere there's water in a crowd. Because baptism is your declaration to the world that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That Jesus has changed your life, he's forgiven your sin, and you're a new creation. Okay, we love to celebrate baptism. That is a public declaration of faith in Jesus. I think tithing is a financial declaration of faith to God, because I don't know who gives what around here, Okay? It's, a public, it's a private declaration of faith to God that you trust him with your money. You're saying, God, I don't know how the, the math is going to add up. I don't know how the budget's going to work. I don't know that, that uh, I can get by on living on 90%, but you say that I can, and so I'm going to give you 10%, and I'm going to trust you. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a financial declaration of faith. And, and, and some of you are nodding your head because you're already giving a tithe or more. You're like, yeah, that's right, preach it. <laughs> Some of you are like, shut up, preacher. <laughs> I do not need to hear this. You're kind of like looking at your phone now going, how much longer is this? Where are we going to have dinner? I'm, I'm going to tune him out. Look, I'm just telling you this because it's for your benefit. We've already talked about how, you know, generosity benefits the giver. We're talking about how God commends generosity. I'm just telling you that, that if you want to step into this promise, then you got to practice generosity. And I, I just think tithing is a financial declaration of faith of you toward God. But see, here's the thing. When we do this, when we start living in generosity, miracles happen. Miracles happen. Let me tell you about a miracle that happened. Uh, and it happened a long time ago because 20 years ago, this month, we started Calvary Christian Academy as a school. We had 21 students, two classes, a small startup fund, and we hired a school director couple who turned out to be thieves and con artists. I'll take the credit for that one. And, uh, but Calvary Christian Academy was started because several individuals at Calvary really had a passion for Christian education. They said, we can do this. We've got a campus that, that's perfect for it. We've got space. Let's do this. Uh, Havasu needs a Christian school with excellent education. So we, we started this school, and the second year, we discovered the embezzlement. 
uh, they had cleaned out the startup funds, about $40,000, and it was gone. Uh, they'd also saddled Calvary Christian Academy with about $30,000 in costs because they weren't paying payroll taxes, and uh, they had run up the credit cards. Uh, at the time, we had about 35 students in three classes, and the question was asked, should we just close the school and consider it a, a failed experiment because we just blew this, and there's all this money that's going to take to keep the school operating, and all the money's gone. What do we do with that? And Calvary decided to honor the parents and the teachers and commit to finish the year. Okay, we're going to finish the school year. Figured it would cost the church at least $40,000 to keep them afloat through the end of the year. Uh, by the way, that may not seem like much now when you look at the budget, but the budget then was about one-tenth what it is now, so that would be like today looking at a cost of like $400,000 to finish the year. It was huge to the church then. We were a little church, and, and uh, not that little, but we were, we were a whole lot smaller than we are now, and, uh, and we decided, hey, we're going to do that. So here's the miracle. Calvary Christian Academy finished the year, and the enrollment was going up, and we decided to move ahead with another year, and the church never missed a dime. Completely finished in the black. And so today, because of the faith of a small congregation 19 years ago, because we trusted God financially, today we have a financially strong, fully accredited Christian school with about 300 students in it. Isn't that amazing? But it's because, it's because we stepped into that place of generosity and faith and said, God, we're going to trust you. And he supplied the needs. You see, when we trust God, he blesses us. It's that simple. So are you trusting God with your money? Are you living generously? Would God commend you for your generosity? Um, if the answers aren't what you like, then I can't think of a better time to start living generously than today. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you were generous towards us and you sacrificed your one and only son so that, we, so that we could have hope, so that we could have life, so that we could be forgiven because through Jesus' blood, you redeemed us from hell. You paid the price for our sin and adopted us into your family. And Lord, we hold on to that, that uh, gift that you have given us, that generosity of grace poured out into our lives. And we thank you for that. And God, even as we all struggle with money, I pray that we would hear your voice. We would surrender our lives, our hearts, our minds, our devotion, and even our finances to Jesus and give you control of all that we are so that we can make a life-changing difference in this community, Parker, and to the ends of the earth. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.